All right, this is the final lecture of chapter 11, section 11.5. What I wanted to do in this lecture is highlight some of the difficulties or challenges faced in reduced order modeling. Again, this is from the book, Data Sense uh, Driven Science and Engineering by Kutz and Brunton. You can find more details here, including everything for this chapter, code notes, as well as all the other chapters. Okay, so recall that we're interested in model reduction. We're interested in taking some PDE that we've discretized and which is extremely high dimensional, finding a low rank subspace to embed that PDE in, and then running simulations in this new subspace, right? This is gonna be this uh, new proxy model or uh, that we're gonna build with the hopefully the re a good representation of the true solution of the system, okay? So the surrogate modeling idea is is old, it's been around for a while, people have been using it, as, and partly because uh, no matter how big a computer you can build, people are always trying to do simulations that certainly are much bigger than whatever biggest computer you're gonna build are. Uh, but the idea is to take this high dimensional sub simulation and bring it down to some subspace that gives you a very good approximation and is much cheaper to run. There are problems. So I've showed you sort of the outline of how this stuff works, but part of the problems have to do with symmetries uh, and rotations being one of them, but what happens when you have symmetries or rotations or invariances in your problem? I'm gonna give you two canonical examples, one in which you get essentially a complete failure unless you handle the situation, and the other one in which it can potentially work, but it's all about this idea of like, you know that there should be some low dimensional embedding, and these symmetries and rotations, if, you're, if, if there's, they're often very difficult to integrate into the reduced order modeling architecture, which means it's gonna artificially inflate the dimensionality of that data. And let me give you very, in, I think, intuitive examples of how this is happening. A uh, first thing I give you is a traveling wave. Suppose I have a PDE, and this is its solution. So what you see here, of course, is a bump. It's not changing its shape, it's just moving across the grid. To some extent, you would say it's like a one-dimensional object. It's just this wave that's translating. So you might say, well, all I'd really need is this mode, which is like a one degree of freedom system with the translation variable. So that's, that's all you really need to capture this dynamics. However, what we've done so far is to think about taking snapshots of my system and doing a correlation, right? To look at the correlation matrix to see what are the dominant correlated activities of patterns of activity in this data. And you can see this is gonna fail immediately, right? Because if this wave is over here, how is it correlated with that wave over there? The data matrix does not understand it's the same object translated or shifted from each other. So this idea of invariance and shifting is really problematic. And in fact, it's been one of the problematic parts of machine learning, especially in the early days, where when they were doing image processing, for instance, trying to do image classification of faces or dogs or cats, you had to carefully crop all those images so that there was no invariances and no translations. Otherwise, your correlation scores would blow up and your feature space would be just washed out. And you can see it here. If I take this data matrix, run it through an SVD, here's what the singular facts value spectrum looks like. Here's how many modes I would need to represent that, somewhere around 30. This is not a 30 degree of freedom system, it's like one. It's just that I have the wrong coordinate system. In other words, the SVD is not capable of handling this translational invariance. By the way, here it is on a log plot, so you can see it's just this very f slow rollover of the singular value spectrum, creating a, a, a real problem uh, for this. There are methods that have been developed to try to handle this. So there's some recent methods out uh, that basically say, well, if I have a translation wave, how about if I do an alignment of this wave? In other words, find the frame of reference, find this moving frame of reference, reset all the data, and then do your, your model reduction in that new coordinate system. So these are the kind of techniques you might try to use on something like this, where you have fundamentally invariance that the SVD is gonna uh, choke on, okay? Remember, the SVD isn't that smart. It's, it's an extremely powerful technique, except for you do have to have 
data in alignment if you're going to get correlated features. And this is one of these examples that shows you that it just completely breaks down. And in fact, if you want to look at more carefully at the modes, that was a singular value spectrum I showed you. Here's the modes it picks out. Here's the, the top four modes, both for the spatial mode and the temporal behavior of those modes. So the first mode is right here. It's this orange one across here. So that's what it thinks the dominated correlated activity is of that trampling wave. And here's what it's doing in time. It gets big, it gets small. Look at these other modes. It's almost trying to build you some kind of uh, polynomial basis expansion with these special functions. So right, there's even odd modes here. This is what the SVD gives you for this data. And you look at those mode structure, there's very little interpretability to be done for that translating wave into these modes and their time dependencies. Right? It just, it is the wrong tool for the job if you have that translational invariance, you don't take care of it. So again, if you knew what the wave speed was, then every frame you could say, well, reset the wave speed. I'll just change and do a change of variables into the wave speed variable, so I lock myself in along that, along the pulse, so now I'm in a new coordinate system attached to the pulse, and then it would be one mode, which would look like a bump, and in time it would be constant, because that's all it's doing. It's a very boring system, but this really boring system uh, completely breaks down the ROM ar architecture unless you find ways to handle it. Let me show you another one. This is spiral waves. And what I want to show you here is I just basically made a spiral wave that had a localized structure, U, and decayed away so that I don't have to worry about boundary effects. And that's what you're seeing here. Here's a snapshot of it here in panel A. And what I did also, I said, well, let's take this, let's take the absolute value of that data, and let's take U to the fifth power. And there they are. So they're just three representations of really the same basic spiral wave phenomena. So this thing's just rotating around. And one of the questions you could ask is, now what I have is not translational invariance, I have rotational invariance, right? So this thing's just rotating around. And again, this is a classic problem in image processing that people have had to overcome, which is if you put in pictures of people's faces in the real computer vision systems, you have to also rotate those pictures and slide them around so that you can augment the data set so that the computer vision software doesn't get confused when someone tilts their head because all they've seen are straight up faces. So this is the, so, so this is like a very standard problem in when you're using correlation. Uh, uh, convolutional neural nets do a great job of trying to get around some of that, but still convolutional neural nets don't handle rotations that well. So you have to artificially rotate the data in, in, in a lot of uh, data practices. But anyway, these are just three representations of really the same structure, just U, absolute value, U fifth. And I'm going to show you that if you start looking at collections of the data, you get very different, you know, singular value spectral decays. Uh, even though this one you got lucky with because it's rotating around in a circle, it, it actually works out pretty well to do the SVD. So if you take a long time snapshot of this thing and you do the SVD, that's right here. This is a singular value spectrum and this it was on a log scale. Look at this. It's almost perfectly two modes. There they are, the two modes, they're down here. You might think, well, how much energy, is, how much variance is really there? And look at this, down to 10 minus 16. So it's down a numerical round off. It's almost it's perfectly two modes. And what are they doing? Here they are. They're oscillating against each other. Mode one and two are this orange and cyan. And the rest of this is numerical garbage. You basically, mode three and four are down here. They're, they're in the noise level. So it's just numerical round off. And this is why it just looks like trash when you look at it, what it's trying to do in time. So what it's telling you is there's two modes that are oscillating against each other to form that spiral wave. And here's what those modes look like. Here's mode one, mode two, mode three, mode four. Remember mode three and four, they, they were noise numerical round off modes. And you can certainly see that here. You can see the salt and pepper of noise down here, but mode one and two are physically meaningful. And what it tells you is these, these two modes oscillating in this pattern right here, the red and the blue, which looks to be like pi over two phase shifted, will actually perfectly reconstruct to numerical precision that spiral wave if you're looking at it from the point of view of this U 
coordinate. So this is good news. You got lucky here because it wasn't translating. In the rotation, it comes back to where it sampled the data. It would be a little bit like if that traveling wave uh, uh, came back, you know, oscillated back and forth, but stayed in a confined area, so you could use a small number of modes to still get that. Here, this is exactly what happens to the spiral wave. It keeps coming back on itself, so you can easily represent it with with the with uh, with this two mode approximation. So it so it's not that these invariances will are guaranteed to destroy a reduced order model. It's just that you have to understand that the minute you have an invariance, whether it's translation or rotation, you have to think carefully about what it's going to mean to your model and your reduced order model. Because you can artificially inflate your rank of the system, which is exactly what happened here in the traveling wave, right? Look at the rank of this system. It's huge, even though it should be rank one with a slide. But in this case, you know, it stayed rank two. It's almost perfect at rank two. And so we didn't get destroyed here by the rotational invariance. Uh, but I do want to point out that even if I just took that data and I looked, I measured a distant quantity, whether it's the absolute value, which is the magenta, or sorry, the cyan, or u to the fifth, right? So before I got perfect Singular value decay, two modes goes to zero. But notice, if I just measure something different, notice the modal structure here. So what, I'm, what you're looking at here is, uh, this is on a log scale here, this is on a regular scale. Now, what you end up getting is there's like five modes that matter uh, for, for instance, the U fifth, and notice the singular value decay for the absolute value. It's, it doesn't really drop off very fast. So this is problematic. So, I took the same simple spiral wave, I measured a different variable, which is exactly what you might actually do in practice, and notice how it artificially inflated the dimensionality of my model, right? Here are some of the uh, temporal modes that are associated with this, but it's very interesting to see this, right? So these are the kind of things that happen in these reduced order models, either by measuring different things or not accounting for the invariances in, in this case. Um, in, in this case, the translational variance is not so bad, but the measurement, the, these different measurements are, can give you quite different results in terms of the dimensionality of the data itself. And by the way, here are some of the modes associated with these. Here are the top four modes. These actually look sort of meaningful. And in fact, when you look at just this here, which is the absolute value, notice that it's starting to give you modes, all of them which look like they could be meaningful. And in fact, the very slow decay of the singular value spectrum says that you're going to need a lot of these modes to represent that simple spiral behavior, which if I had just measured u directly, was perfect with two modes. Here, the u to the fifth, you can actually do this with like six modes. So it doesn't keep going on. Six modes later, you can truncate it and you get like almost a perfect reconstruction to numerical precision. So these are all these subtleties that you want to start thinking about when you do reduced order modeling. It's not just as clear as take snapshots, reduce, build your model, and you're set. It is, in fact, there are some definite markers you have to watch for, including invariances, whether translation or rotation is the most common in PD systems. And if you have those, they're going to be problematic for you unless you find a way, again, to remove them. For the spiral waves, again, you could move yourself into a rotating coordinate system, and then the spiral wave would be frozen. It'd be one mode, right? But you have to know how to find that rotating reference frame. So these are all things that you have to start thinking about if you want to get more sophisticated in handling these things. So that's just a, 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 a wrap up of this chapter. I, I did want to say that you know this, this projection based reduced order modeling method uh, has lots of great features of exploiting low dimensional spaces, but it also has challenges in, in what it can do realistically on, on data. So all the code uh, and as well as a copy of the notes is here on databookuw.com. You can find more lectures on this chapter. And also what this chapter is set up is for us to go into chapter 12, where we now also integrate a fast interpolation methods into the ROM architecture to build models much more rapidly. And it also has a very nice angle around sensor design and sensor placement. So I'll finish off this chapter.